Hey everyone, thanks for joining me again on my YouTube channel. This is Workshop Quick Takes. I have a 2000 Jeep Cherokee XJ that we're going to be back on working on today, and today's subject is heater troubles. Vehicles that are used for low speed crawling or for trailer towing, things like that, are where you will most often see them, and it will usually show up as overheating. But cooling systems on vehicles follow a Goldilocks curve. They can be too hot just right, but they can also be just too cold. What causes too cold? That one's a little confounding sometimes. Well, that's what we're going to look at today. First place you'll notice it is possibly on your coolant temperature gauge if you're in the habit of watching that, or if you have seasons like we do here in Colorado, then part of the year you'll be trying to use your heater for cabin heating, including defrosting the windshield. If that's not working, that's a problem. What's causing it? Well, in the 2000 XJ, there's no uh, shutoff valve to the heater core as there was on some of the older ones, but if you have an older one or any other vehicle that uses a shutoff valve, that valve can fail. Another possibility is that the heater core can clog. It can get filled up with debris if there's a lot of rust in your cooling system, or especially on vehicles that do have a valved heater core, if that heater is not used part of the year, then the coolant can gel up in the heater core and clog it. Now you need to try and flush it, and if it can't be flushed, you gotta replace it. But the third problem is your engine might be running too cold. There's only a couple reasons for that that I've ever heard of. One is that the thermostat fails and it's just open all the time, so the engine is never able to come up to temperature. So let's look at the troubleshooting procedure for that, see how we solved our problem, and maybe it'll help you solve a problem as well. Okay, today I'm troubleshooting a heater problem on my 2000 Jeep Cherokee XJ. One thing I haven't done is try flushing the heater core. What happens is hot water comes up through the thermostat here and then circulates into the heater and into the radiator. There's a bypass here for the heater along with the temperature sensor, and then the radiator is supposed to be controlled by the thermostat. So until the thermostat hits 190 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't allow water to pass through the radiator because otherwise the engine can never get up to temperature if the uh, outside temperature is too low. However, water passing through the heater should always uh, reach full temperature. And for whatever reason, I'm barely getting enough heat to defrost on a mildly cold day. Uh, so what can happen, because there's no filter in the cooling system, is that any gunk or uh, corrosion or anything that builds up in the system and then breaks loose can come up through this hose here, get trapped in the heater core, and then block the circulation. One of the first things you can do, this is optional, but I'm gonna try it, is just take off this little isolation mount here, and then release these two things there. And then that gives some flexibility right there for getting access to those uh, factory style clamps. I don't have a hose clamp removal tool, so I'm gonna try and just do this with pliers. One thing you do want to be careful of while doing this job is that these pieces are plastic and they're usually very old and brittle by now because these vehicles are all at least 20 years old, most of them more. I'm going to try doing this without draining the cooling system. We'll see how that works out for me. It's just stretch a bungee cord between a couple pieces of the hood here. And then when I lift these hoses up, I'm going to try and clamp them onto there so that I keep them above the level of the radiator hose, which is the highest point in the cooling system. And that way I don't just drain out the system by siphon. And another thing to watch out for when pulling these off, especially if you haven't changed your hoses in a while, is that they may be baked onto the metal there, in which case you'll have to kind of work them back and forth. And in the absolute worst case, if it's just time to change your heater hoses, buy the new ones, cut them off here instead, and then just replace them. Now that those are loose, I'm gonna start with the top one here. Keep in mind the direction of flow is into the core up here and down out there. So when I back flush, I'm going to want to back flush from the bottom side first and see if crud starts coming out the top there. These things kind of like to go on better than they like to come off, so sometimes... Okay, quick note, damage the pipe a little bit like I did there. You can always ream it out a bit using a needle nose pliers. And since I haven't flushed this out yet, it doesn't matter that I'm making a few metal filings. I'll get rid of those when I flush. Okay, the next step here is going to be a little unorthodox, but I've got this dishwasher hose. Yeah. I'll give me a little control over uh, getting the water in there, I think. Now I'm going to do what's called the back flush. And oh, look at that. All that rust and nastiness coming out of there. This is what's called a back flush. Because normally the coolant flows in here and out down there. So I'm trying to take anything that's been caught in there and push it back the other direction. All right, finally starting to run clear. Maybe this time not quite to the firewall. 
Now the upper one. One of these days just probably get the right tool for these or else just start using pipe clamps or whatever. Finally I got my little clamp right there. All right, make sure I didn't push any hoses down into the fan. Still full up here, but as soon as it sucks it down, it's gonna drop a bit. Well, time will tell if that solved our problem, but based on the amount of gunk that came out of there, it had to have helped. So that's how you bad flush a heater core. Also appears that the trick for uh, not losing coolant worked out. We didn't lose much at all, and to the extent that we did, it can suck it out of the overflow reservoir later, and I think we'll be fine. So only thing now is to do some extended driving and see if I get heat. Okay, now that I've disproven the uh, heater core as being the source of my low temperatures and gotten a flush, which I needed anyway, I'm going to have to take a look at the thermostat. This was replaced not that long ago, but you know, it's only a $6 nothing part, so they can be defective. And what I saw on the coolant temperature gauge when I did my test drive last night strongly suggested that this thing is not holding until 195 degrees. So I'm going to need to remove these two hoses. I'm going to need to remove this connector from this temperature sensor. And then this bolt and that bolt down there are the remainder of it. And then after that, I have to break loose the seal here, which is gonna be a little bit sticky. Now, in order to do that, I'm also gonna to need to remove this fan shroud right here. And that has a eight mil screw here and an eight mil screw back here. And this one here also has some little bracing on it because it's been broken for a while. So I'll replace that today as well. But first, I know I'm going to lose the top six inches or so of height off of the coolant jacket when I start moving all these hoses, which means I'm gonna spill a fair amount of coolant. So I'm gonna try siphoning it down first just to see what happens. I only got a few ounces out, but it was better than nothing, so let's go ahead and move forward. This insulated conduit strap was my own addition, but it works fine. I'd recommend doing the same if you're uh, replacing one of these. Yeah. That broke off last time. Broken here, 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 and here, all four places at once, so. The one I'm going to replace it with and put in, I actually trimmed some of the lip off down here, so hopefully it comes in and out a little better. And now we should have free and clear access to these two bolts here. I believe those are 12s maybe? Hmm, no. Some English size, it probably comes out around a 13 maybe. One of the best parts I'm working on these old Jeeps. So yeah, that's going to turn out with a 13. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove this electrical connector there, so press in, pull off. And then I've got to remove this clip here using a uh, pliers and get that hose off. Remove that hose clamp that I've added there, get this hose off, and then I'll take the thermostat housing off last. Okay, we have a nice clear view of our connector, so let's go ahead and just loosen that. Likewise again. I'm probably just going to have to do something like this. That one's going to be a little easier to get off because it's a much larger diameter hose. I guess we drained enough. That actually wasn't too bad of a coolant loss. You can still see some down in there that we're going to drop out when we pull this out, as you'd expect, but let's go ahead and do that next. Looks like I can get both of these with a deep socket, so let's just start with the bottom one here. These aren't too bad because it's, even though the uh, fitting on the front here is aluminum, it's actually a steel bolt into an iron head, so it doesn't gall up too badly. Okay. Long and a short. The long one is on top, which makes sense because it sticks farther out. Okay, next step I have to break this free, and it's probably going to tear the fiber gasket. Nope, nope, that one popped right off. Sometimes it tears the fiber gasket washer in half and causes all kinds of trouble on its way out, but that one came right loose. I am going to have to do a lot of cleaning to get that off of there. That's not too bad compared to what it was last time when I removed it. Here's the old thermostat. Don't know for sure if this is our problem or not, but one thing I can do, see it says 195 Fahrenheit, so that's the spec one, but it acted like it was opening a lot sooner than that. Depending what kind of mess you're dealing with, 
you'll need either a uh, razor blade or maybe a chisel in order to clean this off. And if you can't get a nice clean flat surface or you have some corrosion to work loose, you might need to very lightly scuff it with sandpaper to get it good and flat. But in any case, when the new seal goes on, you don't want anything irregular left on this surface here. And you also don't want any of these pieces left in there, as you might expect. There's the path that goes into the uh, heater. It goes right past that temperature sensor there and then out to the heater and bypasses the thermostat, which then allows, when it opens, it allows water to go out here and into through the upper hose into the radiator. Okay, that's most of the cleanup work done on this. Before I put it back together, I'll take it inside and do a very, very light sanding on here just to make sure it's completely clean, wash it to get all this little crud out of here, and then show you the finished result before we reinstall it. However, I now need to do the exact same thing over here, and this is a little more fidgety because I want to try and keep pieces from falling in here. So I'm going to try and scrape them off as much as possible to the outside, and then if anything does fall in there, I'll finish splashing it out in order to get it cleaned up. Here's the old thermostat housing. I mean, that's after doing a light block sanding with uh, 60 grit because some of that was really stubborn and then smoothing it with a uh, much finer sponge sanding like this. But anywhere you can still see those little uh, black gaps and whatnot, especially a couple right here, that's old uh, corrosion damage from a previous gasket leaking at some point. So good uh, to stay up on your maintenance on these things because if you ignore a small leak, it's not going to go away. It's just going to turn into a much bigger leak and maybe even completely ruin a part like this. I'm now going to do the same thing on here very, very gently since we don't really have a lot of material to remove. That should be about as much as it needs. Now ideally I would do this ahead of actually flushing out the block by blowing water into the bottom inlet and then it would come out here. But since I didn't have that luxury today, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this a few times. Partly to bring the water level down so it doesn't leak out on me when I'm putting this back together and partly just to try and get that debris out of there that I just created. Okay, I've now got a decision to make. This replacement gasket came with something I haven't seen before. Uh, it's got an adhesive backing, so you're supposed to be able to just stick it on here and keep everything nice and aligned up while you put it on there. Well, I've always preferred to do that with a thin coat of Permatex Black. This fiber gasket is supposed to be able to seal properly without having to go to any such lengths. Um, that's how, I think that's how it's done at the factory. You just put it in both sides and then screw it in. This obviously has to come out because that opens up the water channel there to the heater. And then these have to come out because that opens two screw holes. But then you're supposed to peel this adhesive off and actually just stick it on right there before putting everything together. Now for putting adhesive, now for putting this on this side, I want just a very, very thin coat. So yeah, not frosting a cake, just a real nice, thin, even layer. Do the exact same thing, very, very thin. And the other thing this will tell me is if the Permatex doesn't stick, then I've got oil or grease or coolant still on there somewhere, which is going to cause a problem anyway. Here's my replacement thermostat. This is a different brand than what I used before, so hopefully if there was an issue with the lot on the previous one, maybe get lucky on this one. And this one isn't notched or otherwise marked for single entry point. Hopefully, it doesn't matter. And that's just gonna sit right there in that slot. Last step is to have your bolts ready. And even though I didn't do it last time, it would not hurt to put just a tiny amount of copper anti-seize on these. Generally, once you've uh, applied adhesive like this, you only get one shot to do this. So you wanna line everything up carefully and then get your first bolt secured in. And then just gently put that on there. Get the second one put down in here, make sure that's lined up. Because this will rotate on me if it needs to. All right, there we go. Get nice and snug. Okay. Keep in mind that we are tightening steel bolts into an iron head against an aluminum surface. It is technically possible to crack an aluminum casting like this, so I don't know what the actual factory torque spec is. That's about what they were before and they weren't coming loose, so 
very next step before I mess with any liquid or water again is go ahead and plug this in so it's moisture tight and I don't see any liquid down in there so we're good okay I have a little bottle of premix here so I'm gonna try and drizzle some of it in there just to fill that back up the head back up a little bit before I start putting hoses back on okay I see the level climbing so oh of course it's climbing on this side of the thermostat and then very slowly receding back into the heater This goes on the floor. Okay, you back up here. Just gonna be able to get the uh, hose and hose clamp down over the original position. And uh, that's as far as that one goes. Okay. So that's how the thermostat swap works on this vehicle. The only problem with this vehicle though is that these two hoses actually the top here and top here are higher than the rest of the water jacket. So you may have to cycle the engine for a minute or two or else use one of those giant ceiling funnels in order to fully get all the air out of the system. Okay, off camera I went ahead and slid my new uh, replacement shield down here and I actually cut about a quarter inch off the lower lip down there and then just smoothed it over with a torch to take the stress points back out of the plastic. And what I discovered is this now slides in and out really neatly. I've got everything secured back in, two 8mm bolts, two 13mm bolts, um, two hose clamps, that's all I removed today. But now what we need to do is go ahead and get the uh, cooling system fully filled. Okay, so far we're in pretty good shape. Um, obviously that didn't just suck way down and go empty, although that could change once coolant starts moving through the radiator again, but we can keep an eye on that. Um, didn't see any new leaks forming down here, just water dripping off from the uh, splash over we had previously. Otherwise, you know, I would have been looking for like a continuous seeping drip or even, you know, a spray and I didn't see anything. So hopefully that's good. The last thing I'll do just to make sure I have extra coolant in the system if it needs to suck some more in after a heat cycle is overfill the uh, reservoir here slightly and then let the system settle and see what happens. Okay, starting from 145 degrees, let's see what it takes to actually pop this thermostat open. Slide that over slightly. Got this thermostat in the water bath it's about the same height as the thermostat, so whenever that opens we'll know. Okay, it's definitely open now. You can see light all the way through it. I got almost 195 though, so I'm not sure what to make of that, except maybe that it behaves slightly different when it's operating inside the pressurized water jacket as opposed to just here in an open pan. The only other thing that'd be worth seeing now is if, as it cools down, does it stay open too long before resetting. 183 degrees and still pretty far open. Down below 180 still has not fully closed. Well, looks like that's our problem. It opens at the right temperature, but it doesn't close for almost 20 degrees below that. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again on Workshop Quick Takes. That ends today's episode. Hopefully you found that helpful and now you're inspired to go take care of one of the projects that you've got out in your yard. Maybe you've got a vehicle that's got heater problems and we've shown you something useful, or maybe it's something else entirely, but now you want to get out there and work on it. Do so. Get that car going the way you want it. We'll see you again next time, whenever that is. Has anyone seen my phone?